Hello, I hope you're having a good day in the Lord. We're starting a new section in our journey through this quarantine time, taking every morning and going through a chapter of God's Word. Um, there's only two things that last forever. The Word of God and the choice, the souls of men, the choice people make about the Word of God. So God has given us this time out of all the things that maybe distract us, some things that are frivolous and some that are actually needed, but here we are in this thing. And we want to use this time um, to be prepared for what God has next for us. So uh, we don't know what's coming, but we do know that we have today to seek him. So we've gone all the way through the Gospel of John. Now remember, the purpose that John wrote the Gospel of John was so that his readers, you and I, would believe. And believe always has to have an object. So believe what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, which means that he's the Savior of the world. But that he's also the Son of God. And that through believing in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, that we could experience eternal life. Um, now, eternal life, remember, from John 17, 3, is to have a relationship, an intimate, knowing relationship with God the Father. So that being said, we're going to now go into the first epistle of John. Epistle is just a fancy word for letter. Um, John wrote letters after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to the church so that we might understand more. So he gave us the Gospel of John so that we would believe. Now, look with me in 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, because at the end of the letter of 1 John, he tells us again why he's writing. So let's read. It says this in verse chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So He's speaking to people who have already surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes as we have surrendered our life, we have doubts. Did this thing really take? How do I know if I'm supposed, what am I supposed to do now with this? Um, he says this, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So in John 17, 3, he told us that, a relationship with God. Eternal life is this relationship with God. Now he's going to explain in more specific what does this relationship with God look like. Um, I don't know about you, but if you gave your life to Christ at a young age, odds are that you went to church and that you struggled a lot as you went through your teenage years about, well, am I really saved? Am I not saved? I almost used to call it Daisy Christianity. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. And through, through my experience, I think that after every worship service that I was in, they would give an invitation and ask everybody to close their eyes and bow their heads. And if anybody wanted to give their life to the Lord, that they should raise their hand and repeat a prayer. And that repeating this prayer they would get done this. Now, now, if you said this prayer and you really meant it, you can know now that you're a Christian. And now, I believe that surrendering your life to the Lord has to start with a prayer. But I don't think there's any specific prayer. The Bible doesn't give one. But it does say that if you have surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, there'll be some change in your life. Excuse me. What kind of change? Change in, with regard to sin. And we're going to talk lots about that as we go through 1 John. Now, I didn't know that there was a whole book of the Bible written for these doubts. So I probably gave my life to Christ, uh, prayed the prayer of salvation 50 times while I was a teenager, never really knowing what this was really about. I knew that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sin. And I think the, the basis of my sin was that 
this sin was going to keep me from heaven and keep me from God for all of eternity. And you don't want that. And so I would get saved. And then nobody ever kind of told me that it was anything other than that. And the Bible clearly states, as we're going to see in 1 John, that salvation is a process, justification, sanctification, and glorification. We've talked about that, so if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and, and watch the Gospel of John videos. But it's a process. It's not an insurance policy. It, we we kind of like the thought of an insurance policy. I have this, I have it in my back pocket, so God and I are fine. But really, it's not that at all. It's a relationship. And the problem that, that I have with a relationship is re relationships take daily effort, daily work. I've been married for 31 years. And the interesting thing is we're still growing in our marriage relationship. Now, in my marriage relationship, sometimes I'm wrong. Maybe mostly I'm wrong, but sometimes my wife is wrong. That's not the way it is in my relationship and your relationship with God. You and I are in a relationship with a perfect, holy God. So if there are problems in our relationship, the problem is with me. And that's what this sanctification process is. So as we dive into this book, I, I call this, uh, this study in 1 John, Me to We. Um, you say, why do you call it Me to We? So there's some good news. I want, I want to give you some good news. The good news is that there is a God. And he has revealed himself. That is really good. He's explained to us what he desires from us. So in Christ, we have endless hope. But without Christ, we have a hopeless end. And so coming at it this way, this me do we, remember the message of Easter was come and see and then go and tell. That's what God has commissioned all of us. That through our communion with him, we would then love others enough to share the gospel message with them. What's amazing, the statistics from Barna Group say that less than 5% of professing Christians have ever shared their faith with someone else. Now, that's an alarming statistic. If you were part of that statistic, I want to help you through this. The, going through 1 John, if you're really coming at it, really desiring the search for truth, this will help you understand where you're at. Because you're either, number one, not a Christian, not been justified, whereas then you can go and surrender your life to the Lord. Or maybe you have surrendered your life to the Lord and then you didn't ever know what's next. And so we're going to walk through that together. Um, the me do we. So then you can... Uh, do what God's commissioned you to do. As Paul puts it, I'm not going to receive the, the, the gospel in vain. What does that mean? If I, if I receive Christ and I become a Christian, but yet it never pours out into someone else's life, then, then I've received it in vain. The idea through the whole gospel of John and through the epistles of John is focused around the great commandment. Remember what the great commandment is. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And the outcome of that, the result of that, will be that you will love your neighbor as yourself. How will you know that you love God? You will have this supernatural love for your neighbor. Now, the whole book of 1 John, I believe, is split up into two parts. One part is about loving God. One part is about loving your neighbor. I believe that it's split right in half. Now, let's look at the division. Go with me to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And look at verse 10. It says this. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard, so maybe yours has some different... Um, word sometimes it says manifested or this is the way it's brought out into the open who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are look what it says anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one 
who does not love his brother. So look, let's think through the template. He's going to explain in greater detail in the first part of this book what it looks like to practice righteousness or in other words to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Then the second half of the book will lay out for us in greater detail what it looks like to love your neighbor or here it says love your brother. Now if you have a pen get that pen out and I want to give you some terms okay so I'll give you a second one, two, three, four, five. I give you five seconds. Now, you got a pen. If not, just pause the video. This whole process is going to look like know the truth, practice the truth, and mature in the truth. This is what this whole process of sanctification is going to look like for you. So, as you walk through that, I'm going to give you some different terms. It would be nice if John always used the term love the Lord your God when he's talking about uh, abiding with the Lord. But let me give you some terms, some synonyms for the first part of the great commandment that he's going to use. Okay, you ready? Here it goes. First, practicing the truth. Sometimes he calls loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and uh, yeah, mind. He calls it practicing the truth. Sometimes he calls it practicing righteousness. Sometimes he calls it fellowship, koinonia. Sometimes he calls it abiding, just like he did in John 15, right? If I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, that's this loving the Lord your God, this relationship with God. He goes up. Sometimes he calls it being perfected, okay? That's another word for maturing. Sometimes he calls it keeping the commandments, we're going to make it clear that the commandments that he's talking about in 1 John are not the Ten Commandments, but rather the Great Commandment and its results. He's going to lay that out for us. Sometimes he calls it faith. You know, you've heard in 1 Corinthians 13, now abides faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. In this text, he's going to use the word faith to talk about loving God and love as the outward actions of loving your neighbor. So Paul does this too often. Uh, so sometimes he calls it walking in the light. So whew, that's all kind of intro into what we're going to do today. So we're going to dive into 1 John chapter 1 so that we might know that we believe. So let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for an opportunity to get into your word. We thank you for giving us, revealing yourself to us so that we could believe, but then even helping us after we believe to assure us that we are growing and that we're not just playing a game in our own minds. So, Father, thank you for your spirit. May he have full reign in what we're doing right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we start in remembering that the theme... Of the gospel of the epistle of John is how do I know how do I know that I believe we've asked this question several times already in the gospel of John but remember this thought if I don't have a new relationship with sin then I don't have a new relationship with God so this is going to be all about sin and remember how I view sin remember we talked about our pronouns before I came to faith in Christ, the pronouns that I used for sin, because I recognized sin even before I was saved. I recognized your sin, their sin, uh, his sin, all second person and third person pronouns. Sin was always out there and it was done against me and it angered me. But when I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came in, remember John 16, he convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's the spirit of truth. He's going to show me the truth about myself. He helps me see my sin, and then he comforts me that Jesus Christ has taken away the punishment for my sin. So when I surrender to Christ, the pronouns change from second and third person to first person. Me, my sin, my problems, my confession, 
These are things that we're going to look through in 1 John. As we begin, in the first four verses, he kind of just gives us an introduction. He gives us some facts, maybe, about eternal life. Remember, eternal life is a relationship with God. Now, he says, right from the beginning, we heard and we've seen and we looked at and we touched the word of life. Now, we know from John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The word. So the word there is the logos, is the person, the incarnation of God. Jesus Christ, the second person in the Godhead. And so here he's affirming the word of life. How do I know God's heart? How do I know God's mind? He gives it in words. And the word is the person of Jesus Christ. And so it says here, we heard him, we saw him, we looked at him, and we touched him. I can't say that, but John was there. And now he's giving a testimony. Look what he says. Um, this life, this word, he's talking to us about life. And this is, look down at the end of this verse too, it's eternal life. So he's giving us words about how to have a relationship with God. Now, this relationship with God did not begin with Adam. Look what it says. The life was made known or manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. So Jesus Christ and God the Father have had this eternal fellowship from all of eternity past. The only time this has been broken was on the cross when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When the sin of the world was placed on him, when he became the propitiation, we're going to talk more about that word in the days to come. But think about it. There's always been this eternal relationship between the Father and the Son. And God created us to come in and partake of that. And even after Adam's sin and the fall of mankind, Jesus Christ is coming, the word of life, coming to show us how we can be reconciled and uh, regenerated back into uh, this relationship. This relationship isn't about you, it's about the Father, and about the Son, but we get to be partakers in that with them. Look what it says. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we're telling you. And my prayer is, what's happened in my life is I have seen and heard, and now I'm telling you in the prayer that the Holy Spirit will prompt you to hear and understand and then go proclaim. Remember, come and see, go and tell. But you can't tell someone something that you don't know. And so there's a lot of fear when we first get saved. I want to make sure I do this right. And all too often, uh, the instruction we get as new believers is very minimal. It's usually in front of the whole worship service. And so they say, well, come tonight and get baptized. And you get baptized and you never have to say a word. And, and then... They tell you, well, now, just know that you never have to worry about your eternal uh, security any longer. And then what happens? What now? This book's going to tell us the what now. Look what he says. So the word, Jesus Christ came. He's giving us a picture of what it looks like to have a relationship with God the Father. And now he's saying, by faith, if you believe... You can be part of this fellowship. Look what it says. This is so good. He says, so that, the whole purpose is so that you too may have fellowship with us. So Jesus is saying, and this fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So he's inviting us in to be with him, to be with the Father, to be a part of this. So I'm going to have fellowship first with God, with Jesus Christ. But I'm also going to have this fellowship with other people. That's where we get the me to we. Um, once I've surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, he saved me. I'm justified before God. Now the whole sanctification process is not really about me any longer. I'm done. It's about glorifying Jesus Christ. And it's about helping other people know about him. Now, 
many people think that evangelism begins by taking a class at church or at a, a Bible college or seminary, and that you go and you read books and they give you outlines and you, you, you go and you take surveys with people and this is how you do evangelism. I'm not saying that any of that is wrong. What I am saying is that if you, if you begin to do evangelism, with an outline that somebody else gave you, you're missing the whole point of, of evangelism and how God wants to use you. This is going to help us with that understanding. Um, as we go to chapter uh, one, verse five, we're gonna go five all the way through chapter two, verse six. This is the most pivotal part, I believe, of first John. The most pivotal part of really knowing that you're a Christian, knowing, how do I know that I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind? How can I know that? How can I know I'm not just playing a game, okay? And, and in this, the reality is that if I will share what I learn in these first two or three chapters of 1 John, if I share this with other people, then I'm going to be used by the Holy Spirit to help them, to convict them of their own sinfulness. So are you ready? Uh, I call this uh, the if statements. There's seven of them, seven if statements. If maybe is the scariest word in scripture because there, every time you, you hear the word if, there's a choice in either this or this. So there's seven choices here uh, to examine in your life to see, have I really been justified? Do I really believe that Jesus is the Christ? And do I really have eternal life? Look what it says, verse five. This is the message. So I love the way John writes, it's really clear. I, I, we've heard from him. So this isn't something John made up. He heard the message from Jesus and he's announcing it to us. And the message begins with this. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. Now, if you want a real fun study, just take out your concordance or get out your phone and do a word search throughout the whole Bible of the contrast between light and darkness. It's amazing. Right from Genesis 1, where the world was in darkness and God spoke and light came, and all the motif of light and darkness. Now, I want you to understand here that the basis of light and darkness is not some kind of metaphysical thing. It's, it's about as practical as it gets. Darkness conceals, light reveals. Let me say that again. Here, what he's talking about, it's not some deep spirit. It is deep, but it's not hard to understand that darkness conceals and light reveals. Now, light always is more powerful than darkness because darkness really isn't anything but the absence of light. So here, when it says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, he's saying, okay, nothing can be covered up from God. God sees all, God knows all, God, it doesn't do us any good to try to hide things from God. Yet we're born trying to do this. This is what, in the Gospel of John, why people got so angry. Remember, Jesus comes in and he says, I am the light of the world. In John 9, he makes it clear. He's just uh, healed a man that was born blind. and he, He's telling people, yes, I have power to make blind eyes see, but I also have power to help you see spiritual things that you're blind to. As we begin this, I want to go take your Bible and turn back with me to Acts, to the left a little bit, Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, I'll give you a second. Acts chapter 17, you find it? Okay, so in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, Paul is giving a sermon on Mars Hill, um, and this is what he says in verse 26, he says, well, look at 25. It says, he served by human hands as 
Let's go to 24, I'm sorry. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now, keep stick with me, verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live all on, on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So even think about this right now. God knew exactly what was going to happen today. And he's got you here right for this specific time. He's got me here for this specific time. Now listen. Then he says this, that, okay, for the whole purpose of this, that, they would see God. Man, what's awesome about this is if you're right here now and you're going through 1 John, that means today you are seeking God. What's the outcome? If perhaps they might grope for him and find him. So picture this. We're born in darkness. God is light, but we can't see it. Go back and read 2 Corinthians 4. The, the God of this world has blinded our eyes so that we can't see the, the light of who God is. But God can do a supernatural work and can shine that light and open blind eyes. He says that we might grope for him and find him, though he is not far away from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. So each day, when any of us get up out of bed, there's evidence that God is giving us life and somehow that we can start seeking him and if we seek him we're going to find him god is light first john 1 verse 5 god is light and in him there is no darkness at all if there's a dark problem if there's a concealing problem that's with my sinful nature and your sinful nature so now we're going to go through seven if statements first if statement here we go um, we're going to keep calling these throughout the whole book of 1 John. We're going to call these the if statements. Sometimes we'll, John calls them the commandments. Um, but this is what it looks like to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Uh, verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with God and we walk in the darkness, we what? We lie. And we're not practicing the truth. Now remember, in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, if, you don't, if, you're, if you're not practicing righteousness, you're not a child of God. So there's a tendency for us to want, uh, to want to make ourselves look better than we are. So a lot of people go to church. Uh, they give money. They try to be a big deal by being good people. And he's saying here is, we like to say we have fellowship with God. But going to church and giving money and having positions in the organization isn't necessarily evidence that you've truly been born again. So what's the evidence that you've been born again and you're in an abiding relationship with God? Look what it says. You're not going to be concealing. You're not going to be hiding your sin. If I say I have fellowship with God, yet I'm concealing, I'm walking in darkness, so I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I still sin. And so before I was a Christian, I sinned. After I became a Christian, I still sin. So what's the difference? The difference is before I was a Christian, I would hide my sin. After I've become a Christian, I'm not concealing my sin any longer. Now think back. What's the first thing Adam and Eve did when they sinned? First thing they did was try to cover it up. Right? They went and got fig leaves and tried to fix the problem themselves. Didn't work. Then God came along and wanted to have fellowship with them. And what's the first thing they did after that was to go and hide from him. Now, keep your finger here. Go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, verse 19... I'll give you a second. John chapter 3, verse 19. It says this. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. That's Jesus. 
He came in revealing sin. It says, and men loved the darkness rather than the light. So men loved concealing their sin more than they loved Jesus revealing their sin. So that's why they were motivated to kill him, right? As if killing the light would change the, the reality of the sin in me, it did not. Look what it says, it says why? It says for everyone who does evil hates the light. Now remember, evil is just anything not directed through a relationship with God. So before I became a Christian, everything I did was evil because none of it was led by a relationship with God. We saw in Peter's life, even though he was an apostle and a disciple of Jesus, he was doing evil things. He was uh, cutting off the ear. God didn't guide him to cut off the servant's ear. God didn't guide him to go in and try to uh, stop his uh, trial. God didn't tell him to go in and deny you even know me. See, those were evil things because God wasn't guiding him. So before I became a Christian, everything I did was evil. After I became a Christian, certain things are evil if they're not directed from my relationship with the Lord. Now, the but here is good in verse 21, which is going to help us see 1 John. 1 John is all about verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested or brought out into the open as having been wrought in God. And God has taken the punishment of my sin. That's what wrought in God means. He is the propitiation. So now I can come into the light without being afraid of punishment. Let's go back to 1 John. It says, verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we're concealing our sin, we lie, and we're not practicing the truth. If I'm having fellowship with God, there's going to be this process of God showing me my sin. So let's ask this question. How long has it been? How long has it been since you've been in the Word and God, through His Word and His Spirit, have produced conviction over that sin in your life? And then, did you choose to agree with God over that conviction and say, what you've revealed to me is sin, and I'm going to turn from that sin and I'm going to get reconciled with you? This is initially the process of what it looks like to be a Christian. If, I'm going to, if a sinful person like me and like you is going to come into a relationship with the Holy God, the only way we can do it is if we're in Christ, who's perfect. But just being in that perfect position doesn't mean my practices are perfect. Now God is working through my practices, conforming them. And I can willingly walk through this with him because I don't have to be afraid of hell and punishment and condemnation. Remember Romans 8, 1. Now therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So first if, if you say we have fellowship with God yet you're still covering up your sin, you're lying and you're not practicing the truth. Um, if you know someone, especially with your children, if your child uh, maybe got saved at a very young age yet, Every time you, your, your child does something right, gets, has to get caught for it and, and instruct them on what this looks like. Coming into the light, dealing with your sin before you get caught. Um, if I have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit is going to be prompting me to deal with my sin before I get caught. Now, initially in these stages of learning, I'm going to resist that and I'm going to suppress that and so the Holy Spirit is going to make sure that I get caught and go through that pain of having to deal with my sin so work through that let's look at the second if statement verse number seven but if we walk in the light so if I'm if I'm daily revealing the sin that God shows me in my life you know he doesn't show it to us all at once but what God shows to me 
I, I'm willingly dealing with. It says, if I walk in the light as he himself is in the light, God's in the light, God and I have fellowship with one another. And it says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, let's ask this question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ's blood is powerful enough to cleanse you from all sin? If you add, answer affirmative yes to that, as, as I would, as I, I say, I have faith. I have faith that Jesus Christ's blood, booyah, has taken away, cleansed me from all sin. So the punishment's gone. Now, the way that I proved the outward manifestation of that faith, it's easy to say I have faith, but what's the result of that faith will be that I come into the light about my sin. I'm not hiding my sin like I did before I got saved. Now, if the Holy Spirit's there and I do try to hide my sin, he's going to make sure I get caught for everything I do. If you're a Christian and you can sin without getting caught, then you're not a Christian. First, if, if you're, say you have fellowship with God and you're still hiding your sin, you're not practicing the truth. If you are, if you are walking in the light, it, it's because you believe that Jesus Christ's blood has cleansed all the punishment from sin. Now, let's keep going. Look with me at verse 8. It says, if, if we say we have no sin, now that sin there is singular, so it's talking about my nature. I have, an, um, I have an inward sinful nature. The problem that I have is not what I do. The problem that I have is who I am. That's why when Jesus came, he wanted for us to be born again. Another word for that is regeneration. Okay? He didn't come to say, try harder, be better, reform your life. No. I hear so many people confused about this. They say, oh, I, need, I know I need to get my life together. I know I need to get back into church. Uh, I need, no, none of that will do it. There are more people in church these days that don't understand this. Until you begin by understanding that your very person, your very nature is fallen. So it says, if we say we have no sin, the world says this, you know, everybody's basically good. This whole idea of socialism and communism. Uh, socialism and communism is absolutely right. If, should everybody do the right thing? The problem is people don't do the right thing. And so in the church, the church is a socialistic structure. Everybody had everything in common. And so as the head, Jesus Christ, was guiding people, they would give, and they would help, and they would do. The way the world does it, they cross God out of the socialism and the communism, and they put the government in charge. So now you, you've taken a perfect holy God who is guiding all of it to now sinful, broken people. And it leads to a lot of pain and a lot of death. So if we say we have no sin, who are we deceiving? If I think I'm a good person, the only person I'm deceiving is me. And guess what's not in us? The truth. Now remember, Jesus is the truth. When he, he showed us what that looked like, and then he's given us his spirit. So if you have the Holy Spirit living within you, there's no way you're going to think you're a good person. Um, there's, there's just no way. The Holy Spirit is in you, and he's going to be showing you the sinfulness of your nature. Okay, now, initially, this is really hard. When I first become a Christian, I, I feel like I should feel better, but now all of a sudden I feel like the most wicked sinner that I've ever, and this is the point. He's helping me see my sin, and this is humbling me, and in humbling me, it brings me down so I'm not trusting in my own understanding and my own strength any longer, and then he comes and he comforts me, reminding me that Jesus Christ has taken the punishment away. Next if. First if, this one about nature, the next one about actions. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, okay, this one's not nature, this is my actions. 
So I know I'm not a good person. How do I know I'm not a good person? Uh, because of the things that I do. The things that I do just reveal my heart. So it says, if we confess our actions, our sinful actions, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a wonderful promise here. God doesn't show me all my sin at one time. It would crush me. So the things that the Holy Spirit is showing me, I'm willingly coming out into the open about. I'm confessing. What does that mean? First, when I'm aware that I sinned, the Holy Spirit is the one that makes me aware of that. The first thing I do is confess it to God. I'm confessing to God that I have sinned. And then if I, let's say I lied to you, then I'm confessing to God that I lied to you and that's sin. Then I'm coming to you and I'm going to get that right with you saying, I lied to you. That's the first two aspects of confession. The third aspect of confession is that I'm going to be ongoing confessing this. Um, I'm going to confess to you that I'm a liar. The, how many lies does it take to be a liar? One. Now, none of us like to think of ourselves as liars, but the, the reality, the truth is that I have lied, so that makes me a liar. Even though I've confessed that and I've been forgiven of that by God and he's reconciled me to himself, even though I've maybe gotten that right with the person that I lied to, let me be ever aware that in my fleshly nature, guess what I am? A liar. And when I'm talking to someone else that doesn't know Christ, I'm going to start with this aspect of my life about how I'm a liar and I'm a cheater. And I've done all these things, but God has forgiven me and God is changing me. And that first puts them at ease because I'm confessing my sin to them. And then the Holy Spirit can use that, right? He's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. As I confess the truth from my own life, then God has something to work with in their life. But isn't it wild how in church what we've done is we've turned that around. And we, we, we think we're better than people. So then we go out into the world. And if we're part of even the 5% that goes out and shares their faith, mostly we're pointing out their sin and saying, you need to come to our church and be good like us. That's not the message of Jesus Christ. The church is supposed to be a place of light, not a place of darkness. Which means we should be actively living a lifestyle of confession and repentance. Uh, I love the great preacher Adrian Rogers who said the Christian walk is walked on two legs and those two legs are confession or repentance and faith. Those two things. Now let's keep going. It says this, verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, not only uh, have, are we lying to other people and lying to ourselves, but we're actually calling God a liar. Is that a good plan of action? I don't think so. If we say we have not sinned, I didn't do anything wrong, we're making God a liar and his word is not in us. Now this is very important because you can go and look at James 1, through 25. It describes the word of God as a mirror. And it says that when I look at the mirror, it shows me me. So if you can read God's word, this is a very pivotal point. If you can read God's word and it's not showing you your sin, then that means the Holy Spirit is not there. That means you need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. Then the Spirit will come and he will bring the word alive. Now, if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit is living in you, yet you're never in the word, then there's nothing for the Holy Spirit to use to work with. So remember, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit come together to produce conviction. And from that conviction then sprouts from me the choice and then I repent. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's all about that. So here, um, first, the Christian's talk will match his walk. Second, walking this walk, I'm going to be exposing my own sinfulness. I'm going to expose my inner sinful nature. I'm going to expose my outer sinful actions. 
and I'm going to agree with God about my sin. That's this whole essence. Now, chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to recognize that I don't have to be afraid of I don't have to be afraid of the wrath of God. Look what it says. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. So let's ask this question. Can I go a day without sin? Um, yes and no. Now there's sins of commission and sins of omission. Um, there's sins that I commit. I'm actively outdoing them. And I'm, there's sins that were, have I loved enough. Okay, so I would say, can you go a day without committing a sin, a sin of commission, an act of rebellion against God? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Can I go through a day without rebelling against God? Absolutely. How do I do that? I abide in a relationship with him throughout the whole day. Now, that's what he says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But the cleansing from all unrighteousness is the part that we do every day. D did I love my neighbor enough today? That's the question. This is where, excuse me, every Christian falls short every day. But God says, if you'll go through this process of dealing with your, uh, the sins that you commit, then I will grow you in these others. As we talked about from John 15, uh, abiding in the vine that the abiding in the vine is going to produce fruit remember we talked about this if you not go if you don't remember go back and watch the John 15 video but as I commune with God as I love the Lord my God with all my heart soul strength and mind right abiding in him it's going to produce fruit in my life and this fruit has negative and positive the negative is Confession of sin and repentance of sin. That's the active part. Okay, The passive part and the positive part is that as I do that, God produces the fruit of the Spirit in me. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, self-control. These are things that God produces as I'm being humbled and choosing to confess and repent. So it says... I'm writing these things so that you do not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father that's Jesus Christ the righteous. So if you can picture in heaven, Jesus is in heaven, and God the Father is there, and Jesus is the advocate or the mediator. He is, in a courtroom, he would be the defense attorney. And then on the other side, we have an accuser or the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney is Satan. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's saying, ooh, can you, I can't believe that Dan is a Christian. He just lied to so-and-so. There's no way he's a Christian. And then Jesus steps in and starts showing that he is the answer to my sinfulness. Look what it says. He himself is the propitiation for our sin not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. This word propitiation, don't be scared of it. It's a wonderful word. It's this thought. The wrath of God is building. Remember, I'll read this to you very quickly from John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, let me find it. In John chapter 3, the very last verse, chapter 3 verse 36 says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So if I don't have an abiding love relationship with God, then I have this abiding wrathful relationship with God, where the, instead of the love of God abiding on me in, in a relationship, I'm separated from him in the wrath of God on me. And I'm unaware of it. I'm born with this wrath like a balloon getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's going to one day burst at the judgment, the great white throne judgment. But if, if I surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came. Propitiation means he satisfied that wrath. He took that wrath on himself. It wasn't like God the Father just said, well, I can just, just not look. It's okay. I'm just going to let that go. God can't let that go. 
So Jesus Christ came in as our substitute and he propitiated that. He took the wrath. This is what he was so burdened about when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion. This is in the Seder, the Passover meal, the fifth cup, the cup of God's wrath. Jesus Christ drank all of it. And he is enough to take on the sin of the whole world. Does that mean that everyone will be saved? No, because in order for me to be saved, I have to willingly come into the light. And most are unwilling to do that. Look what it says. So we've got six ifs done, okay? So let's look at the seven and we'll be done for today. I know this has been long. It says, by this we know we have come to know him. How do you know you have eternal life? How do you know that you believe? We've, we've gone through six steps. Where are you at in these? When's the last time you were shown sin in your life? How did you respond? Did you come into the light about it? Or did you do just like the lost world and try to conceal it? Look what it says. If we keep his commandments, that's how we know. Now the commandments here are not the Ten Commandments. We know this because the Ten Commandments were, are the character of God on display to show us our sin. No one can keep these, okay? So that's why Jesus didn't come to get rid of the law. Remember, he says, I came to fulfill it. So Jesus Christ came and he was perfectly righteous. So now you and I can practice righteousness. Jesus Christ never had to confess and repent sin. You and I are going to have to constantly confess and repent of sin. This command, the commandments here is the great commandment. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. The aspect that he's revealing is the loving the God part, and that's related in these six ifs. So the seventh if is, go back and read the first six ifs. Are you being obedient to coming into the light? Are you being obedient to uh, knowing you have a sinful nature? Are you being honest about your sinful actions and seeking confession and repentance of them? Are, do, are you trying to even lie to God? Do you realize that Jesus is your advocate? That's what he's saying. Let's keep reading. It says, the one who says I have come to know him, I'm in a relationship with God, and does not do these seven ifs is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. Perfected doesn't mean sinless perfection. It means I'm growing, I'm maturing. I'm I'm growing every day, getting to know God more. How's this work? Not by trying harder to be better, but be honest, more honest about my own sinfulness. Okay, that's a key distinction. It's not pretending and trying to do better. It's being honest about my failures, and then God comes in. As this humbles me, then he comes in and starts to produce this new life in me. Why does God do it that way? Because then he gets the glory. And I come away saying, wow, look what God has done. And there's no pride that I can take in it for myself. We have to finish. Look what it says. By this, we know that we are in him. How do I know that I'm a Christian? How do I know I believe? That actively confession and repentance of sin are actively going on in my life. He says this. The one who says he abides in him, okay, ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. If I'm in a in fellowship with God, there's going to have to be this dealing with sin. You say, wait a minute. When I became a Christian, I was told that I never had to deal with my sin. Jesus forgave all my sin, past, present, future. He's taken them away as far as the east is from the west. Now, that's correct in the sight of God. When God looks at me and you, he doesn't see my sin. He sees his son, Jesus Christ. However, I still sin. You remember back in Numbers 21, we were in Genesis 3, and we had talked a little bit about the snake on the pole. Let me make sure it's, I think it is. Let's make sure of that. Yeah, go to Numbers 21 again and read the account of the snake on the pole. And Jesus revealed, Use this as an illustration in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. But in closing, just think through this. That 
They asked that God would take away the snakes that were biting them and killing them. They, they had confessed their sin. We have sinned. God, will you take away the snakes? And God, instead of God taking the snakes away just like that, he tells Moses to make a pole and, and, and hammer out a brass snake and put it on the pole. And then everyone who looked at the serpent, the snake on the pole, and believed God's word would not die even though the snakes were still biting them. Now, eventually, all the snakes went away. But initially, the snakes were still biting them. Just the effects of the snakes weren't killing them. Jesus used this as a picture of him on the cross. He said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself that whoever believes in me wouldn't wouldn't perish so right now one day when we're glorified the sin will be gone no more will I have to deal with sin but that will not happen until I have my glorified body right now the the snake of sin is still biting me still biting you it's just I don't have to worry about the condemnation and the eternal death that comes along with so it. That being said, if I really believe that Jesus' blood is enough to do this, then I will willingly come in the open, come into the light about my sin. I will confess my sin to God. I will confess to the person that I've committed the sin against. And ongoing, I will be confessing what I am in and of myself. That does not make a big deal out of me, but man, it makes God's grace and God's mercy and the work of Jesus Christ and his spirit makes it even more huge. So this is what it means to bring glory to God rather than seeking to give glory to myself. Every time I confess sin, I'm giving glory to God. Every time I conceal my sin, I'm trying to make myself look better. I'm trying to bring glory to me. So this is the first chapter of 1 John Tomorrow we'll hit chapter two. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We pray that your spirit would, would that the, the, the still small voice of your spirit would get louder for us, Father. That in this time of uh, being out of our normal activities, Father, that we could get in a room and be quiet with you. Father, show us your glory. Show us our own sinfulness. And Father, may we repent of it, and may we seek to know you better each and every day. Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray.